For those of you wondering how Scientology recruits new members and persuades them to part with their hard-earned cash, this video will be interesting. Today I'm speaking to someone who has never shared their story publicly, someone that was recruited in Birmingham here in the United Kingdom, and someone who was persuaded to take out over £100,000 in loans to pay for Scientology courses. This person has never shared their story publicly, so please welcome my guest for today, Dave Griffiths. Dave Griffiths, welcome to my channel. Hi, you all right? <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, how are you? Yeah, uh, a bit, bit, uh, a bit scared, but I'm all right. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be all right afterwards. <laughs> well, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me and share your story. Is this? I believe this is the first time you've shared your story publicly. Am I right? Or have it you is. Yeah, this yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I've been. I, I've sort of given a few anecdotes to people, um, but I've never actually spoke spoke publicly like this now so that's why i'm a bit exciting sort of <laughs> exciting stuff you'll be fine <laughs> everyone <laughs> in this community i found is so nice and welcoming and encouraging and i have been overwhelmed at how many comments people leave on the videos i do with people who speak out for the first time just overwhelming support and encouragement so i think you'll be okay <laughs> yeah that's cool but do we want to talk let's let's talk a bit about your history like do you want to introduce yourself who you are why you're here talking to me <laughs> um and you know how how the whole scientology thing happened for you yeah so um yeah yeah i was involved with scientology for about 17 years as a public i, I never joined staff or the sea org or anything like that and um, spent an absolute fortune which we'll come on to later and um, yeah so I was I, I got involved when I was about 21 I'd say I think it's 1993 so I was working as a computer programmer there's a there's a few things about myself that um, I, I I was I was kind of looking for a psychology book or something because there's a few things about myself one was I had high blood pressure which was I was really young and I didn't believe that it was a physical thing. I thought it, I was just, because every time the, the doctor had taken, you know, I'd get nervous. And there is such a thing as white coat syndrome when your blood pressure goes up high when somebody's taking it. <laughs> and uh, I just assumed that's what I had. And they wanted me on uh, beta blockers, which were like really strong and sort of zombified me a bit. Um, so I thought there was something to do with my mind in that respect. Um, other things was uh, I wasn't very confident at work. I was a great at computer programming, um, but I wasn't uh, like my, my boss was really enthusiastic and he kept getting me to do presentations to the whole company, which was horrendous. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so I didn't really like that. Um, mm. So, so yeah, I wanted to be sort of more confident and uh, I just, just became interested. I thought, well, I've sort of learned how to understand how, computers work I was I thought I'd be interested to see how the mind works as well um so one day I was walking down uh the outside of the Palisade shopping center in Birmingham there's a, there's a ramp that you walk down and uh I saw this leaflet on the floor and uh it said it had a picture of Einstein on it and it said we use only 10 percent of our mental potential and um there was another flyer on the floor and it, it got the other side and it's at this book dianetics and i didn't pick it up because I, I didn't want to look like i was just picking up stuff off the floor so <laughs> i ignored it <laughs> a, a few days later somebody else was handing them out so i thought oh, i'll grab one of them this time um so yeah so the, the the picture of einstein obviously caught my caught my eye on the other side there's this advert for the book dianetics the modern science of mental health and it was saying that 70% uh, of uh, man's illnesses are psychosomatic. That means they're caused by the mind. And you can get rid of them using Dianetics. And you can tap into the other 90% of your mental potential and solve all your problems, basically. Um, I didn't know at the time that um, there was two falsehoods in that uh, title, Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. One, it wasn't modern. It was actually released in 1950 <laughs> so by, by the time I bought it, it was already 43 years old and uh yeah there's nothing scientific about it <laughs> it's, it is it is a pseudoscience there's no sort of 
you know, you know, I mean, obviously it got all debunked by the uh, professionals at the time. Which obviously, you, you, you don't know when you get the book. Mm. Um, so yeah, so so I I ordered the book. Um, I had to send a check off to the Dianetics Foundation, and um, that sort of a, arrived a few days later. So the Dianetics Foundation, I imagined it to be like some sort of research centre with students and like all these clever people. <laughs> Um, I knew nothing about Scientology at the time. I didn't, you know, I had no interest in religion. So I wasn't looking anything for anything like that. I was just, you know, looking at ways of helping myself, really, trying to, you know, be more confident and do more stuff that I wanted to, wanted to in life. Um, so that's um, that was my introduction. Um, I started reading the book, and uh, obviously it talks about uh, your reactive mind, so there's two parts of your mind. You've got the analytical mind and your reactive mind. And the analytical mind is the clever part. <laughs> and the reactive mind is what kicks in when you're unconscious or in pain. And at that time, um, it's it's still sort of recording things in the background, which can impact you later on. So, I don't know, say if you're running in, down the street in the rain and you fall over and get knocked unconscious and people are talking around you, all this can sort of reactivate later on in life, according to Dianetics, um, if you're in a similar situation. Um, so, so I was I was hooked. I, I read the book and I was like, oh yeah, I, I need some of that. And the big promise of Dianetics is that you re reach a state called clear. So um, I was, I really wanted to be a clear. <laughs> so um, this was getting rid of all these incidents that have ever happened to you and refiling them so that they don't affect you anymore, which means you're sort of freed up to be completely yourself and you've got your own sort of, you're fully confident. And there were a lot of claims that he made that, uh, you know, you'd never get a cold again and you, you, you could recall recall anything that ever happened to you easily. You know, if you were to say to me what happened uh, three years ago on uh, Monday the 1st of January or something at 10 o'clock, <laughs> I'd, I'd be able to tell you, but obviously, yeah. So are you suggesting you reach the state of clear and you don't have that ability now? Uh, no, no, I never got that far. No, shocker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, surprisingly. Um, yeah. <laughs> sure. So we'll you come on to that. But yeah. So you, you bought the book and you thought it could help you understand the way your mind works and, you know, understand more about yourself. And you had yeah. all these expectations of what the Dianetics Foundation was going to be like. What yeah. what was what was it actually like when you first showed up and you opened the door and were like, right, I'm here. What's this all about? How did that come across? Yeah, so they kept phoning me up and saying, oh, you'll have to come in. We do personality tests and we do an IQ test and all that stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know. And I worked in Birmingham anyway, and this was um, at uh, Constitution Hill in Birmingham. They were still there then. Um, so I, um, yeah, I, I went in one evening after work and um, there was a sign saying Church of Scientology and I was a bit like, oh, what's that? You know, I was a bit, <laughs> but I'd read Dianetic. I'd read like probably half of Dianetics and I was already sold on it. I thought, this, you know, this is great. This is. And um, so I, I went in there and it was a bit like, uh, just like uh, offices really. And um I got some old tables that were like probably from an old school or something. Um, but the one thing that struck me was there was a, a poster of John Travolta uh, with his wife, Kelly Preston. I didn't know, know who she was at the time, but um, the big poster saying, we're members. And I thought, oh, you know, um, at that time, that was before he had his big sort of comeback. So um, he'd... Um, I sort of grew up watching Greece and uh, Saturday Night Fever, so I was, I was a bit of a fan, like from yeah, you know, and things like that. You think, well, you can't be dodgy if he's into it. <laughs> and obviously, yeah. that's what they rely on is these these celebrity endorsements. And you think he's he's been successful, he's been a good actor, and everybody knows who he is, and he's you know got a good life and made a bit of money. So you know there must yeah. be something to this. He wouldn't you know fall for a cult or anything, surely? <laughs> yeah, you think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so I had a 
did a personality test, which is the 200 questions. Uh, some, some of them are bizarre. Um, but I filled it, filled it out, and then I did an IQ test. Um, the personality test, another thing that got me was um, it said Oxford capacity analysis. So everybody's assumption is that it's Oxford University. Um, so, so you think it's all sort of official, you know, it's got some scientific, scientific basis behind it. Um, so, um, yeah, so I filled those out. Uh, but in got, actual fact, there is no link to Oxford at all. It's just the name of a thing that Scientology come up with. There's no link yep. to Oxford in any way. It's literally just called that because it gives that impression <laughs> that you just talked yep. about, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so uh, I did. Uh, so I had the results from the personality test, and um, yeah, of course, I was depressed and uh, withdrawn and all these bad things, <laughs> and. Um, the IQ test actually was quite good. I had a 140, I think, was and I was saying, oh, you know, you could be a, an executive and you're in the top 5%. I was like, oh, you know, bigging me up. Um, but um, the personality test, yeah, that was quite bad and kept highlighting some things. You, you need to do the Dianetic seminar. And um, I was like, yeah, I was quite tempted, but it was, I think it was going to be about 50 or 70 pounds. Um, and I didn't have the money. I mean, it's, I was just on my first job. I think I was on about 11,000 a year. And um, I thought, well, I didn't want to sort of do anything without talking it out with my long-term girlfriend at the time. We'd been together for about four years then. Um, so I said, yeah, I'll have a think about it. And uh, so, so I left. And um, I went back and told the, my girlfriend about it and... Uh, She's a bit like, what do you want to do that for? <laughs> so I had a bit of a bit of an issue there. She's like, you know, are well, you going to spend your money on that? You know, we've got to save up for an house and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I had this sort of a bit of a battle going on behind the scenes there. So um, so uh, we sort of talked things out. We had a few issues about it. And uh, she said, well, I don't mind you carrying on reading the book. It's just, you know, so I sort of left it for a while. After a while, I, um, I got to a point where I'd learned about how to do the auditing, but I didn't, it didn't really make much sense. So I wanted to see a video or something, and there was a leaflet for a video in there. So I thought I'm going to pop in and uh, get, get the video. And by this time, I moved to Albert Street in Birmingham, and I went in, bought the video. And uh, they said, I'll come back tomorrow, tell us, tell us what you thought. And I watched it and it was, it was a bit rubbish. I didn't really learn anything else. Because <laughs> so. I don't know about back then, but when I was on staff, the, the DVD of Dianetics was literally just the book being read out with some nice imagery and stuff. But it's not like it gives any more new information or content than what you've already read in the book. You know, yeah. there are extra chapters and stuff with the examples of how Dianetics works and so on. But in in the main part of the video, the DVD is just someone reading the book out. So if you've already read the book, you're not really going to learn much more <laughs> from watching yeah. the video other than seeing it, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I went back the next day and uh, um, I was, I said, yeah, I didn't really learn anything. It didn't go into a lot of the detail that I wanted to learn about. And um, they say, well, you know, you need to come and do the seminar. And I said, well, that's going to cause me grief with the girlfriend if I start coming in. And <laughs> um, so um, I said, well, is, is there a way of you can audit yourself? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, you can do self-analysis, which is another type of uh, auditing you can do. Um, you, you, you get a book and uh, you recall different things recall different perceptions you'll, re it'll ask you like say uh, recall the time you first kiss somebody or something like that and you, it's all like positive things that you recall and it's supposed to make you feel better um so i went away and did that for a while and uh, didn't make a lot of difference to be honest but i did sort of believe a lot of the sort of claims in there that you you know it's, it's going to make change your life but i really wanted to get some proper auditing and be clear um so I just sort of did that in my own time, really. And um, they, they kept inviting me into the organization on a lunchtime, and I could listen to tapes and lectures, mostly about the tone scale and um, 
uh, understanding other people, human evaluation tapes. That was it. Uh, yeah. So what was it that got you the kind of that made you kept coming back? Because if you read the book and you go, yeah, this is great. And, you know, I want to learn more and you get the DVD and it's like, oh, you know, that was OK. I didn't really learn anything else. The self-analysis you said you're like, mm, yeah, that was OK, but it wasn't spectacular. Like what was the seed in there that made you think? I want to pursue this and see if there's something more. Was it the claims in the book about going clear and the promise and hope of a better existence? Because I think that's what a mm. lot of people kind of, yeah, the evidence they've seen so far at this point hasn't blown them away, but there's, you know, the seed has been planted that there is possibly uh, a, be a better existence you can have for yourself through doing more of this, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I think what, what I sort of wanted really was the Dianetics. And, you know, in hindsight, if I had have done the seminar, maybe I'd have thought that's rubbish and that would have been the end of that. <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. Um, so but, was that you ended, did you end up doing the, the seminar in the end after a bit of time and listening to the tapes and everything? Or did you jump into a different uh, service? No. So, um, I ne yeah, I never did the seminar, actually. Okay. Um, so what happened was I, I sort of, I mean, over, over the next year or so, I just sort of, Doing these, doing some of some of the self analysis and popping in on a lunchtime, and uh, they charged me a pound to listen to a tape from the PTSSP course or something, mm -hmm. which was quite interesting. Um, didn't understand half of it, but <laughs> you, know, you know it runs like waffles on for hour and a half, and there's like one what one, one thing that you're supposed to learn from this tape, and you might mention that somewhere in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so very true. So very but, true. But for me, never never studying psychology or anything like that, I just thought it was me who didn't understand it. I thought because because he was so uh, verbose, he had such a wide vocabulary, and um, he came across as very sort of intelligent and he's charismatic. And uh, so for me, a, a youngster who didn't know any different, I thought I was learning from somebody who was really clever. But then. What happened was um, a few a few months down the line, I think it was towards the end of '94. Uh, I was approached by the registrar, registrar Roger Ellery at the time, who's now a famous author, um, and he said, uh, "How would you like to be clear?" I was like, "Well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, if it was real, you know. You'd, yeah." So I was like, "Yeah, yeah." Um, he said, how much did you uh, pay for your car? I said, £5,000. Now, this was quite a lot in those days. That was probably 10000 now. Um, so he said, well, what if I was to tell you you could be clear for, for a lot less than that? I said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Sounds reasonable. Um, so he sold me. Uh, well, he tried. Well, he did sell me. <laughs> sold me the... Um, they had a scholarship in in those days you could do a training package where you learn all the auditing techniques to audit somebody else to clear and it's called a co-audit and they'll, they'll audit you to clear and he said yeah it'll probably take about two years to get clear i thought well you know two years to get clear that sounds good and i was like oh yeah but i can't you know uh knowing like the issues my girlfriend had and that my parents knew nothing about it. I thought I just kept well away. Um, uh, they just kept throwing the, I kept getting mail and they kept throwing it into the, into the bin. <laughs> so they were trying to save me at that point. Um, but for me, I, cause I'd already been sold on it. It was like, well, they, they haven't read the book, so they don't know what they're on about. <laughs> That's true. And, uh, and there's no yeah. getting through to you in that um, period of time because you've, seen it's helping you and you've done a little bit here and these people are really nice and you have no reason yeah. to believe it's anything other than something that could help you and um you, there's probably an element of you that goes well look i'm gonna do it and then all of these people my friends and family who don't want me to do it they'll see the benefit because when i get yeah. clear then they'll see the change and then they'll understand so that, that you know why not yeah yeah, and that's what, you know, the way Roger sort of sold it to me was, you know, if you improve yourself, then everybody in your life benefits, which makes sense. Um, 
also sort of during that period um i think there's a bit of press about i don't know if it was that year when lisa marie married michael jackson and so there's a bit of press about scientology and um i i uh i think i said to vicky uh, well, we've had a bit of bad press and she said oh no uh, michael jackson's getting audited Can you imagine if he'd be what he'd be like if he was ot i mean i had no idea what ot was all about in in those days you know that's like higher levels above clear um uh, yeah i wasn't really interested in that but um this sort of just shrugged it off and uh, there was some some news about one of michael's brothers was getting involved in scientology yeah there's a lot of these pointers that you think like there's these magazines um celebrity magazines lying about and there's a picture of clint eastwood in there so obviously his friend because clint was never into it as far as i know uh, obviously his friend had invited him and it's something to do with applied scholastics the um the educational stuff so there's all these um all these you know celebrity things sort of quietly influencing me i must i must be part of something good um so yeah um so roger tried to sell me this uh package um it, which uh, which was three and a half thousand pounds and I, I sort of said no at first and he's like well what you, you know what you got to lose i was like well my girlfriend my family <laughs> <laughs> you know those small not insignificant things <laughs> oh yeah yeah and um he says i guarantee that you, you won't lose either I think that's, that's a bold statement pretty bold yeah and uh, i don't know like if anybody uh, unless you've ever met a registrar they're uh, very convincing and that uh, you can't you just can't get away <laughs> you can't say well you can say no but yeah it, it's I'll get never you in the end no. yeah it's never a no it's a no for now <laughs> yeah yeah so um so yeah he sort of reg, reg we call it regged don't you he's regged to death i used to say so, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to remove every barrier you might have to buying the service. So he starts asking me questions about, well, you know, how much is, have you got any debts or whatever? Have you got any payments going out? And I said, well, you know, I've not got long left on my uh, car payments. So I was paying about £180 on that and had a bit of credit card debt, about £1,000, something like that. And um, so we worked out. He said, I'll tell you, uh, for like twenty pounds a month more than you're paying out now, you could get the whole package and you could get clear. And I was like, oh god, <laughs> what? there's no <laughs> use. Like, what are you going to say to that? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the thing with regging and sales techniques. You know, I used to be the director of product book sales. I know these techniques very, very well, and it is very much about like whatever excuse is thrown at you, you figure out a solution to that, so that then there's no more excuses left and it, it's a great sales tactic but it's manipulative because what you're doing is not giving someone the option to just say no i, I don't want to do this that's yeah. okay <laughs> but not yeah. in scientology no is not an answer yeah yeah so um i think he, he, he sort of got me to agree to do it and uh, then i went home and the next day i was thinking i don't want to do it i don't want to take that you know that's that was a lot of money <laughs> considering i was on eleven thousand pounds a year or something at the time it was, um and um so i found him up and said uh so yeah i've thought about it i'm not ready to do it yet and he said oh, okay um do you, can you just come in now because i want to go over something with you <laughs> so i went in didn't i <laughs> and um so i was in the in his in the reg, registrar's office again and uh invited my new friend dave in there the core supervisor so they, they were both selling it to me and um in the end i just said okay <laughs> <laughs> it's like i had nothing left i just you know mm. you know this is worse than you know people trying to sell you a timeshare you just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just give in right <laughs> yeah so i thought okay well and also the the i also had this belief that these people are the sanest people in the world they've got dianetics this is and they're supposed to be the most ethical people on the planet so maybe they know 
they're doing the right thing and maybe I just put some trust in them and go with it. So, um, so, so I did and yeah, and Roger was showing me like, um, showing me this uh, printout. He said, look, I was up till two o'clock sorting this out. After you said yes, a bit of guilt trip in there. And uh, yeah, so, so I, I agreed to it in the end. And I said, well, I'm going to tell people. <laughs> I've just done that, you know. How we're going to, you know, find time to come in and do it and all that lot. And he's, he's coming up. Um, he, he actually, oh, actually, yeah, he organised the um, loan for me as well. He said, oh, yeah, we've got a company. He'll give us, sort you a loan out. And uh, he took me round to this uh, bank, HFC Bank. And it was all set up for me to sign on the dotted line, and take out a loan. <laughs> Which was that owned to be by before. Scientologists, or was it was it like a standard uh, high street bank that they just standard had high a street good bank? Yeah, H with? HFC bank it was, right. um, but they did charge a lot more interest than other um, people at the time. But Scientology obviously had a good relationship with them that they could just take you there and it's all set up and ready to go. Yeah, yeah, I think as far as they're concerned, they'd handled them. <laughs> they'd sort of you know made it safe for them to go to them and just ask for loans so they had a good relationship there temporarily i don't think it went on forever um yeah so so there i was then um i had this big burden on my shoulders then so <laughs> and um he said right uh he said just go in and enjoy christmas we'll come back after christmas and we'll start training you up and you know don't worry about handling anything yet so there I was with a massive secret, <laughs> trying to get on with my life. And a massive loan. <laughs> and a massive loan. Off. Yeah, yeah. And that was just the beginning. They wanted to start me on the purification rundown, which I had to pay for because that was included in the package. And um, so, yeah, my debt started mounting up. In fact, one time I did say, I said, like, can I just have a refund and I'll just pay for things separately because I just hate having this situation. It was like I was dreading people finding out and it was all blowing up and it would be a big disaster. Um, in fact, somebody found uh, my mum the once from the org and said, oh, uh, he's Dave there. And I was like, no. And he said, oh, I'm from Scientology. He paid for some course, but he never started it or something. So my mum found me up. I've had this very strange phone call. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, when it came to doing the Purif, um, I, I did the started the weekend and um, went back and uh, she was quite upset that I was leaving her on the weekend. I said, well, I've got to do it every day. That's how it works. You know, you can't have any breaks. And I went the Sunday morning and then um, we turned up at her parents and. Um, she started getting upset, and her mum's like, "What are you crying at?" You know, and then she comes in, and as her, as her mum comes in at me, "Why you do? Why do you always do something like this? Fucking Dianetics, fucking Scientology." I was like, "Oh, I didn't even know she knew anything about it." You know? <laughs> and um, you know, it all sort of blew over. But um, I didn't go in the next day, and then um, I think it was a bank holiday, so I went back in the org on the Tuesday. So I'd already missed a day of the purif. And um, I told them what happened, and uh, I think it was Vicky said, um, Donna's mum is an SP. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Now, that was just based on the fact that she said always a generality. <laughs> I'm sure that anybody would be sort of angry and cross and worried about this thing going on that nobody understands. And uh, I didn't think she was an SP, to be honest. I just think she didn't understand what was going on. Um, but um, um, so I had to start the PTSSP course then, <laughs> another five hundred pounds. Uh, so I had to figure out how to pay for that. Um, you can see how all this is all adding up. Yeah, after finishing that course, which lasted months again, you know, this months later, um, I did get on the purification rundown again. Uh, yeah, I did my personality test again. And it was amazing. Everything had gone up all up at the top. And uh, I think Hayden, I remember Hayden filling it out. He was the uh, 
the boss at the time or the senior CS and um, and he was smiling when he saw the results. I was like, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> it looked like I'd had all these amazing changes, but I didn't necessarily feel like any different, a <laughs> little, little bit different maybe, but it was like, according to these results, I should be like feeling amazing. And I thought, well, perhaps things have changed, but I'm just not aware of it. And, you know, going through life, things will be different, whatever. Um, so before this happened, I, I was I was talked into paying three thousand pounds for some for six was it six intensives of auditing? Wow! It's quite they, they had this real special offer. That's a deal. <laughs> yeah, because an intensive yeah. is twelve and a half hours of auditing, right? Yeah, but it depends where you get the auditing as to how much it costs. You know, the city level or gets much cheaper than at Flag or in LA or something, but yeah. it's still not cheap. You know. So uh, six intensives, three thousand pounds. That's more than that. I think probably I what, think fifty percent or something. Sixty. Yeah, and it was it was proper cheap. Yeah, um, I think that's what it was. Hmm. Um, and what it was, it was for people who'd never had any professional auditing, and you could get some auditing. And I mean, I when they first mentioned it to me, I said I'd want to be bloody clear for that much. <laughs> yeah, it might, it might have been six thousand. I can't remember. It was a, it was a deal anyway. It was like yeah. so cheap. And um, so I'd been talked into buying that. So God knows how I paid for that. More loans, more credit cards. It's all starting to build up now. And um, still nobody knowing about it either. So it was like I'd, I was trapped. So the only way I could go is forward. I couldn't sort of, you know, it's like you're climbing a big ladder and you can't look down. You just got to hope that you're going to get to the top and everything will be fine. That's what it was like. Are you familiar uh, with the sunk cost fallacy? I am now, yes. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. That's that's, that's what that's exactly what you're describing. You know, this idea of well, I've already paid so much money, I've already spent so much time. I kind of have to keep going because I don't really want to admit. You know, it's it's too hard to turn back now. You know, you're kind of committed in your mind, right? Yeah, yeah. So the the only solution was to keep going and hope all these miracles I'm promised are going to happen. Mm. I'm going to become this amazing person and all everything will be right with the world. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, after after the purification rundown, I was, um, I think, uh, yeah, I was talked into, they said, well, why can't you try and, try and keep the same sort of schedule you've been doing and uh, you can get, so you, you might as well do the, um the next step the trs and objectives um in the uh with, with professional auditors It'd be a lot quicker you don't have to um you know spend months learning how to do it you can just i say yeah, okay then there's no mention about paying for it i just thought they were offering it me which was very naive and um after a after uh, a few weeks of doing it i said is this coming out of that auditing that i bought said, yeah didn't i tell you <laughs> so that that was all sort of used up after a while but um and that's ridiculous because that's something like trs and objectives are a bit like no one really pays to do trs and objectives professionally with an auditor because that's something that you know you can do with other people twinning and all of this sort of stuff like it's not you only really pay for pro professional TRs and objectives. Like if you have a bunch of money on your account or, you know, you're having trouble or whatever, like the fact that they got you to use your auditing hours for that, if they'd have given you the option, you probably would have said, no, look, I'll do that with the co-audit and then I'll use my hours for the yeah. next step. Right. Rather than. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah Cause I thought that that auditing would be used to solve some of my bigger problems in life, like you say. So, mm. um, so, yeah, so I went through uh, TRs and objectives, did um, ARC straight wire, that carried on, and then it got to a point where, and to be fair, I was really enjoying it, you know, just talking to somebody every day and uh, having these realisations about stuff. Um, the, the thing with auditing is uh, you get to, you might sort of realise something funny or after doing these repeated processes, um, you'll just start to feel 
euphoric, I guess is the word, and um, it's like getting high, <laughs> and uh, that becomes very addictive, and um, coupled with the belief that you are getting closer to being clear by doing this, you, you, you really think you're making progress. And throw in there as well the atmosphere in the org, because this was a big thing for me, is everyone in the org is happy and enthusiastic and they're all there to help you and it's like yeah we're all on this mission together like yeah. it's a nice cool fun place to be it's not like some stuffy office with loads of miserable looking people kind of that would rather be somewhere else like yeah. they all have this because you have to be when you're on staff that it's not acceptable to have any other emotion than being pure ecstatic and enthusiastic all the time so when you throw that into the mix as well you're kind of it's it's a pull isn't it it's it's attracting you to carry on doing it even though you're not having major major wins you are having little bits here and there and you look around and go everyone else here seems to be you know living a, a better life so yeah i just need to carry on and then i'll get there too i'm sure right is that how you were thinking yeah. at the time yeah definitely and um i think that's the thing because scientology relies on its success stories and which are all it is all anecdotal evidence which you know in the scientific world would just be thrown out <laughs> um and you're, you're sort of told to write a success story straight after so you might be feeling amazing you'll be feeling euphoric you think oh it's great i've really enjoyed that and they get you to write a success success story there and then so you'll you'll put how great you feel and you enjoy this level and or you might go to graduation as well and people say how great it was and um you sort of feel obliged to have the same enthusiasm so i think you're all sort of in the same lie i guess <laughs> you're all sort of keeping yeah. it going it's like you, you sort of think maybe there's something wrong with you well, that you didn't get the, the same as everybody else even just the way the examiner asked the question, you know, when you go to the examiner after the course that, you know, I remember my examiner, which he would say, would you like others to achieve the same success yeah. as you have? <laughs> and it's, it's kind of like, yeah, you do, right? Like, yeah, yeah, of course, you, yeah. It's not a, you know, do you want to write a success story? I'm not bothered if you do or don't. It's like, do you want others to achieve this, you know, too? As well? Yeah. Yeah. And you kind of go, yeah yeah okay cool yeah like you feel obliged you're coerced yeah. into it you can't say ah, it was all right you know i don't really mind if others achieve this or not <laughs> you know yeah. the way they ask the question makes you feel like you have to say yes and you have to write a success story yeah yeah and another thing like we've doing courses mainly is that um when you're finished you're sent straight back to the registrar to start your next one and I remember saying, what if I didn't want to start my next one now? What if I need to have a break? And he said, oh, no, you can't do that. It's, you know, <laughs> looks really bad. It's like something's gone wrong if you're not. <laughs> so that's how the sort of program is like, you know, keep you on this mill, keep you doing round and round, spending your money. Um, yeah, so um, back back to the auditing then. So I was carrying on this auditing in my, in my spare time. And, yeah, I was feeling better about things, a bit more positive. Um, what I did find overall with the auditing was that, yeah, you might feel better for a few days, but everything else just hits you and yeah, nothing's changed really. But um, I was, because Dianetics is the last thing you do before you go clear, the new era Dianetics, then that's the stuff that's supposed to be the real, do where it does the real work. Like the, uh, the lower levels are to just knock out all the bad stuff affecting you now so that you can go clear i suppose you can confront your reactive mind fully um so yeah so i was doing doing these levels and um i got to uh grade zero which is about communication and the uh ep the end phenomena of grade zero is the ability to communicate with anyone on any subject right so for you having done the stcc successory communication course and having a bit of insecurity about public speaking in the workplace and not liking doing presentations i imagine this is is kind of got a lot of promise and hope for you of like wow this is actually something i'm gonna see a real benefit from yeah hopefully <laughs> <laughs> yeah it did help in a way i think i think the thing that i did get from this and it did sort of changed my career path was that 
I did realise that I could actually talk to other people quite comfortably about anything. And before, as I was growing up, I always had an issue with authority. And so I'd be too scared to phone up for an insurance quote or, <laughs> you know, I'd get my dad to do it or whatever. And um, like talking to management, you know, people deemed to be have, have some more authority or whatever, I was never comfortable with that. But I did sort of realise doing this that, well, they're just people like me and why can't I talk to them about stuff? And um, so that aspect helps. Um, it didn't really resolve my fear of talking in front of people. If, 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 if you tell me now to stand up on stage in front of 100 people, I'd be shitting myself still. <laughs> so that never got resolved, even after sure. the Pro TRs course, which I did later. That's, you know, he's supposed to be a complete master of everything by then. Mm. Um, so after doing that, I mean, like I'd been under a lot of because uh, because I, I was working in IT. I think I think my sort of salary had sort of come up to about twenty thousand a year by then, which was you know it's okay. And um, uh, I'd been asked a lot of times by Roger mainly uh, to consider contracting, being an IT contractor. And uh, there was one or two other IT contractors in Scientology. So he put me in touch with this lady and she was saying, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you probably earn 50,000 a year as an IT contractor. And um, she said, yeah, just go for it, you know. And um, so, yeah, I, I started uh, applying to agencies and stuff. And I thought, well, I, I felt confident then that I could actually just go and do it. That was the thing holding me back was my communications ability um so yeah I, I applied for a, a job and i got a job at uh, price waterhouse doing a contract which um, i really enjoyed um, um so i ended up being there about 15 months i think but but before i even started this contract it was all sort of agreed roger gets me in the office and he's like um how much? Uh, how much? How much do you owe now on your loans and stuff? I said, oh, about fourteen thousand. So I says, oh, we need to get it up to thirty. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? He said, now we've got this brilliant plan, and uh, I've worked out how you, we can get you through uh, grade one, one and two, or something like that. And I was like, oh, well, you know. And for me, this was the best way of getting up the bridge, even though it was ridiculous money. It was like I was making progress. If I'd have gone in the course room, I'd, I'd still be on student hat, probably, <laughs> being harassed to do a standard schedule and everything. Um, so by then, I was like, oh, God, so what you got in mind? So he said, I've already spoke to HFC Bank. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, they can give you a loan based on uh, your, your current income anyway. So, um, yeah, if you borrow 15 or something like that, we can get – because uh, the way auditing intensives work, it's about – it was about 17 – I think it was 17.64 for one intensive, which is a lot of money. That's about £150 an hour or something. Or, yeah. um, but the more you buy – the cheaper each intensive gets. It's like a sliding scale, they call it. So um, uh, I think he worked out it, it was like less, I think it was about £900 uh, uh, an intensive. So, um, so yeah, I got talked into that as well. There's no way I could say no anyway. I couldn't say no. It's like, it was like uh, I don't know if you ever experienced this, but uh, when... Uh, when there was raising funds for the IAS or anything like that, they'd be talking to me and I knew I didn't have any money anywhere or <laughs> they'd be waffling away. And then my mind is already working in the background thinking, oh, well, actually, I could put that bit on that card there. And it's like, it was like, I just, I had no, <laughs> had no barrier. And um, it was like, I was a, yeah, I was a bit of a people pleaser, I guess, as well. 
So, so how, um, much, how much debt did you end up having in all when you did finally leave Scientology? God, yeah. I think in the, the worst the worst period was uh, if, if you sort of skip forward to when I was having new era Dianetics trying to get clear. So uh, there'd been a big period where we had no auditor because she left because of Golden Age of Tech 2. She didn't want to train again. And she was a really good auditor in the lower levels. So I had no auditor for about two years. And this is when Chris Malin was training up. So I, was, I had to wait for him to train to be a, a NED auditor. So when he finally sort of got to the point where he could take me on, um, I mean, I could have gone to St. Hill and spent twice as much and, you know, but I wasn't going to do that. Um, so um, I had to buy some intensives for, for new aerodynetics. So, uh, you know, probably bought about five or six or something to get me through it or whatever. So that cost a fortune. And then it got to the point where I'd finish and um, uh, Rachel, the uh, DFP, she'd see me. It was like just before two o'clock on the Thursday or something. Um, right. Uh, you need to get another two intensives to, to finish, Ned. That's your tech estimate. I think you should call it a tech estimate. I thought, oh, fucking hell. But I was so close to being clear, so I thought. So, um, yeah, so I'd, I'd borrow some more money to pay for these intensives. Because you're so close, you're almost there. It's like just, it. just a little bit more debt and, and I'll get there. So it's a little, you know, yeah. and this is what happens the whole way up the bridge is like, what is yeah. just, you're almost to the next level, just a little bit more and just a little bit more. It's like, you know, dangling the carrot on the yeah. stick, right? Yeah, so um, um, so this went on for a while, and then it'd be like, oh, you just need one more intensive. You know, she'd come out looking all serious. Oh, you, you know, this will be it now. And one more, yeah, that's the estimate. And then two more, and then it's one more. And it got to the point where I was pay, paying for an intensive every week. That's £1,764 every week, which is the worst way to pay for it, If you know. And... Um, it got to the point where staff were having to lend me the money. <laughs> they were getting people on staff to lend me the money. And I was like, well, I, I, fuck am I, I'm going to pay these people back. Yeah. I mean, I had a decent job. At that time, I was probably earning about 1500 a week, which was good. But that was all going. And I think going back to my other point, when Rogers said, like, oh, we need to give you more loads, more debts or whatever, it was like I hadn't even had a chance to enjoy uh, becoming a contractor and earning twice, two and a half times as much as I did before. And it was like that was just completely attacked straight away. And um, I wasn't saving enough money for tax each year. So I'd have a big flap and I'd have to borrow money or I'd have to refinance loads of loans or something. But the, to, to answer your question, the worst position I was in, and I think is when I was doing new, new era Dianetics, I thought I need to have a look how much debt I mean because it was getting ridiculous and um, I had uh, 108,000 pounds in debts and uh, plus plus a car which had some collateral <laughs> that was 12 so it was like 120,000 pounds of uh, <laughs> um, so that so and that was split I think I had seven credit cards and I was paying probably £3,000 a month on interest alone. That was not paying stuff off. I don't think I ever paid more than the minimum payments on these credit cards. And you only got into this debt because of Scientology, right? And they oh, very God, clearly yeah. had, they had a good relationship with a bank and they were helping you find this, this and finance this right you know that you said yeah. the staff members were loaning you the money they had a good relationship with the bank to look to get a good loan for it like they have a financial structure in place to try and encourage you to get into debt to give yeah. them the money right yeah yeah and anybody going into the i mean certainly at the time anybody going into the org uh for any services or anything i oh, just put on a credit card get a card get a credit card you know and with now sort of understanding that you have to pay that back. <laughs> uh, but going back to my earlier point about uh, when I was first started contracting and I took that loan out, my bank phoned me up and said, um, oh, we see you've 
took out a loan for £15,000. We could actually do a better one for you. And um, we could save you £100 a month on it. I said, OK, yeah, yeah, let's do that then. I made the mistake of mentioning this to the registrar. He's like, why don't you have both? <laughs> I was like, you can't do that, can you? He said, yeah, yeah, I'll be fine, that will. I was like, uh, but he said, like, you could get clear from doing this. And I was like, that's your whole bridge paid for up to clear. And uh, like you said before, it's like one more step. <laughs> Everything's going to be all solved. And um, so, yeah, I um, kept both loans, basically. So I, I sort of didn't pay the other one off when the money came in. No questions were asked about that. So that's, you know, it was just, it just spiralled from that, from that, that initial three and a half thousand pounds, which I had to lie about. It just spiralled and grew and grew and grew. And so I was lead, leading a double life, basically. It's like, you know, my wife, well, my girlfriend at the time didn't know, didn't know the extent. I think she just suspected and um, it sort of caused a lot of problems between us, the fact that I, occasionally I'd say, we need to remortgage because I've overspent or something. And uh, she just lost all sort of faith in me, I think. She lost all respect. And, um, yeah, that sort of ruined our relationship in a way. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, what was it that kind of, for you, where it all came to head and it all came to a point where you're like, I'm done, I'm out. What what led you to that place in your mind? Was it because your girlfriend was saying, you know, you can't do this, this is not okay and helped you see the light or was it something else? It was it was a lot of things, a lot of little things, but, well, a lot of things that led up to a big, big thing. Um, the first thing was the ideal org strategy. So in 2005, something like that, we started our ideal org strategy at Birmingham and um, we was at this event and uh, I was regged into uh, pledging £10,000 towards this building. I was already screwed. I had no frigging money left. And I was just doing courses then. I was just doing, doing the uh, training side. I, got, I did actually get to um, gra uh, class four auditor training. I did all that. Um, so I was just, you know, ca carrying on with life, trying to sort of keep on top of the finances and start paying stuff off. And it, I was sort of pressured. They said, right, I, it was uh, a chap called George Prowl, actually. He stood up and said, right, I'm going to do £10,000 if I get another 10 people to do it. And everyone's like, whoa, yeah, let's do that. I was like, fuck you. Know. And so I got Roger and Vicky next to me going, you should do that, Dave. You should do that. You should do that. You should do that. You should do that, Dave. We're going to do it. I say, I got no fucking money. You know, I've got no fucking money. He's like, well, yeah, but it might. This is just a pledge. It's, it's. You'll you find know. the money. Yeah. I said, yeah, and it'll, it'll take. Uh, you know, this is going to take a couple of years at least to sort out. So we'll figure it out. And you know, at that point, I thought, you know, I thought I, I did get, you know, I did it. I went along with it. But then I thought, yeah, do you know what? My marriage is over now. I can't see, it, you know, I've got no way out of this. It's like all this pressure to keep donating and, and everything. It's not going to survive this if it finds out. And um, which was fair enough. Um, so that, that that was the first step. And then the, the continuous sort of harassment for money for the ideal org, it was just ridiculous. And... Um, so I did split up with my wife. We, we, we did get married, but it lasted about two years. <laughs> so um, that. Yeah, it was okay. I mean, um, and uh, I think, you know, she did say it was for the best in the end <laughs> when we did. But um, what had happened was our, our relationship had sort of just, you know, became sort of non-existent, really. We were living like brother and sister, I guess. And understandably, you know, the, you know, all this financial worry I was putting on the relationship. And um, so it sort of, yeah, it, it didn't really work out. And I sort of, I was really friends with uh, a young lady at work who 
we got on really well. We've been friends for a year and it sort of turned into something more. So um, I sort of left my wife, told her I'd met somebody else. That was quite a, a painful time for all of us. Um, um, but when I did that, yeah, so uh, instead of Scientology supporting me and saying, uh, oh, yeah, we understand Dave because obviously, you know, she's held you back from getting up the bridge and, you know, you've got a new partner now, perhaps she'll be more. <laughs> you know. But now, now uh, you need to come in every day. You need to come into ethics every night now. I was like, well, that's the fucking last thing on my mind. So I was going through this breakup <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I had a text saying, I don't think you realise how serious this situation is. So um, after a while, I did sort of go in and saw ethics and stuff. And uh, I had to do some conditions, things, <laughs> including so cleaning. You were, you were having yep. issues with your relationship that is caused by Scientology. And yep. their solution to that is to make you do lower conditions, which is a punishment for yourself. Yeah, yeah, because I'd sort of met this other lady and uh moved on i guess mm. but you know I, th I thought in some sort of naive way they'd be like oh yeah you know yeah you've done the right thing now whatever and you know uh i had to clean out the purification rundown sorters <laughs> to make up for up you know upsetting scientology i was like what the fuck you know yeah there's wow. no other sort of organization gets you to do stuff like that as a paying yeah. public as, as well. As a paying, that, not, that's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> you're not even staff. You're you're paying for these services. Yeah. And they say, yeah. oh, you've upset us. Go and clean the purif room. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So I started uh, started this re relationship with my new partner, and uh, she was more open to Scientology. She came in and did a few things. I think she did do the purif at some stage, but she wasn't... Um, um, she, she, yeah, she, I think she, it came to the point when she needed to do the objectives and do the course room. And um, I think the course supervisor was quite harsh with her when she said she couldn't make it or something. And and I said to her, uh, the ethics officer, I said, well, you know, why did he need to talk to her like that? And he's like, oh, yeah, he shouldn't really because he's, he's, uh, he's not a veteran like us, is it? Sort of implying that. It's okay for the staff to treat you like shit and talk down to you and, and boss you about. And if you've been in it for ages, it's like it's sort of accepted that you're treated as badly as everybody else, as a public, as a paying person. You're not treated, you know, you're not given any sort of special treatment as a public. Um, you, you know, it's. It, I think it goes back to the keeping Scientology working reference that says you know if somebody signs up consider they're on the same terms as everybody else win or die in the attempt something like that literally yeah on the yeah. same terms as the rest of us win or die in attempt in the attempt literally it's you're with us or against us like you are on this ship you're on this train or you're not this train is going to depart the station with or without you so are you coming with or not it's that kind of ruthless brutal mentality and when you've been you know, when you're just starting, like you described earlier, joining Scientology, they're not harsh. They're like, oh, let's make this work. You try the seminar, try doing this. OK. But once you've been doing it for a while, it's like, no, you get it now, Dave. Like you you get what how this works and you get the mission we're trying to achieve and you're just going to make it go right. Uh, so you don't get that, you know, nice little, you know, bubble wrap cushioning kind of, oh, you know, hope you're OK. Let's try and make it work. It's it's harsh and it's, you know horrible but that's the way scientologists speak to each other when you've been around for a long time yeah yeah definitely um so um yeah so the sort of ruined things with her i guess in a way just by being too bloody brutal and um it took her a, a while to sort of come back in i mean she came to some events and stuff and um, she didn't have any issue with me doing it she knew when we got together i was into scientology I told her up front that I had these tremendous debts, so that didn't become an issue. Um, uh, so that's a sign of a good partner there. Someone, yeah, that yeah, she's looks a good. Past one. that, yeah, still yeah. together. <laughs> Got two kids. That's amazing. <laughs> um, but um, after a while, yeah. So 
I mean, she came to the IAS events as well, the, the big sort of patron balls where you saw all the celebrities. I was dancing next to Isaac Hayes and, <laughs> you know, thinking you're part of some big group. Saw John Travolta the one time and Tom Cruise came on stage, started singing Mustang Sally with uh, Katie Holmes. It was just surreal, you know. Um, so, yeah, we, we had all that sort of stuff going on. But, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of things that sort of started to, make me just realize it was all about the money i mean you, you think i'd have realized by this point <laughs> but you know i thought it was i was getting some services from it um so i was paying for something particular but the the ias uh fund raising that was ridiculous and the uh ideal org fund raising was really ridiculous and i'd introduced a lot of people to scientology and they just fucked it up every time None of them sort of stayed in. They were just too sort of harsh with everybody. And I was like, you know, I just lost all faith in the staff, to be honest. I was like, you know, how can they cock it up? <laughs> Got all this amazing tech, apparently, how to handle people and give them a better life. But they just, you know, yeah, I just I realized it wasn't working so well. But the just to skip forward to the the reason why i left in the end was um i was invited down to so so, so i'd had loads of new era of dianetics i ended up having 300 hours of new era dianetics which is unheard of apparently i didn't know until i went to saint hill yeah and it was like banging my head up against the wall it's like you know oh yeah i think i'm clear now then because like you know <laughs> i was feeling good couldn't think, imagine anything else that happened in the last 400 quadrillion years or something I was going back to, trying to. <laughs> and, um, so um, it got to the point where my next step was power. Um, I'd, I'd done a few clear certainty rundowns and that come back as negative. If only I knew the line you're supposed to say, I didn't know the line you're supposed to say. Um, so. Um, yeah, so a lot of, like, some people from St. Hilla just turn up at my house sometimes. And, um, and for those of you who don't know, St. Hill yeah. is not near Birmingham, <laughs> right? Uh, St. Hill is in the south of the country. It's like, you know, an hour-ish from London, south of London, right? Yeah. And Birmingham is another couple of hours north of London. Yeah. So yeah. for someone to go all the way from St. Hill to Birmingham, that's a long way for someone to travel. Yeah. Um, just to see you what what did they want <laughs> why were well, they yeah, there they, they just turned up unannounced i'd be sitting there and look out the window and these people dressed up in their sailor outfits <laughs> i was like oh god what do they want and i, I think they'd be doing the just rounds imagine, <laughs> just imagine your wife going dave the space navy's here <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they turn up and they you know say oh we want you to figure out how you do your next step now, after spending God knows how much money trying to get clear and not going clear, I have to do the alternate route now because that completely failed. Uh, the alternate route, I'm not quite sure how much that cost. Was it about 30 grand or something? I can't remember. <laughs> um, I got to a point when I was looking at prices and things and I was like, I'm not even going to bother <laughs> absorbing these numbers because it's just so <laughs> unreal to me at this. I like, remember, you know, you get the price list and you go, this is how much this is going to cost. You know, it's very open. Yeah of like, yeah. this is how much each course costs. And I remember looking to clear and it was like, okay, I I don't have that level of money. So I'm just gonna, what's, what's the next one that I can do? Okay, it's a thousand pounds. Okay, I'll, I'll think about that and I'll worry about the rest later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it so, does uh, get more and more expensive the higher up the bridge you go. Oh God, yeah, so uh, yeah. Um, so the next step was power and power plus, and that was like 10,000 pounds, I think. Um, so I, I uh, was invited down the one day. I said, why do you come down and uh, we'll, we'll just show you some references about finance and planning and stuff, see if we can give you some tech to figure out how you can start saving towards your power. And I thought, well, that's probably a good thing. I could do is sorting out my bloody finances and because um, I was still in a lot so of debt. So if you, if you pay us this money, <laughs> we'll teach you <laughs> how to sort your money problems out. <laughs> uh, well, this was for free. This was for free. Oh, okay. this was, yeah, it was just some hatting, as I call it. Okay. I fine. thought, yeah, okay, that's fair enough. And it was just like, yeah, just, just pop down on a Sunday afternoon. We'll 
have a couple of hours. And I thought, yeah, fine. So I arranged to do that. So I went down and they decided that I was starting power there and then. So um, I, they sent me to the registrar. Right, how are you going to pay for it? I, I do it now. And uh, the uh, director of processing, this lady, uh, I think she's from New Zealand or something, she was, came in, Liza, her name was, oh, Dave, yeah, we've got your auditor, he's waiting. So once you've paid, come on through. I was like, no. So I spent all day there basically being regged and try, trying to get me to do it. And uh, the uh, case supervisor, Peter Thompson, who's the top guy there, they kept going up to him and uh, telling him what was going on. And he just kept going. He just said, keep going. You know, never, he never spoke to me. He was like too important to talk to me. And uh, they were shit scared of him. They were scared. And I was, I was thinking, why would they be scared if he's like a super sane person, the case supervisor, supposed to be, you know, in a benevolent state? <laughs> why are they scared of him? And it was like the, these things started to concern me. It's like, and it was like, we won't let you down, sir. And to me, it was like, well, they're too scared just to not to, not to follow his orders. You know, anybody human <laughs> would have said, uh, look, sir. We spoke to him, and he's got you know got all this financial debt as it is, and um, he can't do it now. There's no way he can do it now. Uh, but we can work out this, or we will do this. We propose this. Not like uh, they had no choice. They had to get me started that day. So uh, it got to the point where I was still there at eleven o'clock, and I said, "Oh right, well we can't audit you now. It's past eleven, and I was supposed to be back home." And um, I said, "Right, you've got to stop overnight tonight." Come back in the morning. We'll find you an hotel. I said, no, it's all right. I'll sort my own out. And they said, well, yeah, I want you to write a letter to the Peter Thompson, senior CS, and and um, uh, tell him you're coming back in the morning. I said, all right. Then. Yeah, I'm coming back tomorrow. Lots of love. <laughs> Much and love. I, yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's it, yeah. Much love. <laughs> yeah, so I had no intention. I thought, fucking hell, I'm just getting home. So I went home. Turn my phone off. Turn my phone on later in the day. Had loads of messages from Liza. Get, I said, I don't know what's get, going on, but get your ass in the car and get down to St. Hill right now. I was like, what? Am I paying for this? <laughs> I was like, you are PTS. You know, because I'd mentioned something about my mum not approving of something or she just pulled a funny face when I mentioned something. And um, I was like, oh, God. So, um, so uh, I, yeah, I sort of left it there, and I started sort of looking. I thought I'm going to have a Google, see if anybody else has had this issue, because <laughs> you're not supposed to Google Scientology. I used to, to be honest, and then I'd end up in ethics, and they'd show me all their evidence to prove it wrong, which you know didn't necessarily do that all the time. So I, uh, I stumbled upon the uh, there's, there's a, some articles by uh, some senior Scientologists, Mike Rinder, Marty Rathbun. I saw their videos. They were talking to the St. Petersburg Times, I think. It was um, the true front down, I think it was called. Yeah, so that was the first time I saw people who still believed in that the, the Scientology tech worked, but that the whole organization was screwed, basically, by David Miscavige. And so, yeah, I thought, oh, God. Yeah, so I sort of stopped going for a while to the org. and. Um, um, so they they sent after a while they sent a chaplain up. They sent a chaplain. He's supposed to come and smooth things over. Sent him up, and uh, he came and apologised. He said, "Yeah, they, those people shouldn't have tried to get you, you know get you to start this course and pay the money. That's not their job, and it was all wrong. Sorry, etc." So I started sort of tentatively getting involved again, just with Birmingham Org, and I went to a few events and. Um, so uh, a few months later, I was invited down to East Grinstead, St. Hill again. And uh, they said, yeah, we need to just you to finish off. Uh, I think it was a security check I'd started at some point. They said, you just need to finish that off. And I said, OK, then. So I went down and I was with Chris Malin, actually. He was uh, he had to go down for something. So I said, I have the dad try and keep me down here. And he said, no, he said, well, I can't because I've got to be got to take me back home i've got a gig tomorrow he says so uh, 
So we went down and um, so I started doing this uh, sec check and, and, and it came up that I was out int, which is, um, it means you've exteriorized, apparently. I mean, and uh, you've, you've got some trouble, you know, you're not quite back in your head. <laughs> that's, that's the way, it, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I never exteriorized. I, I, th I think you have that sort of, I think a lot of people have that idea that you feel like bigger than your head or you might feel a bit out of sorts, so you, yeah, a bit disoriented. Um, so I said, oh, right, well, you're going to have to stop down a few days because you need to do the intro, in, what is it, the uh, intro rundown. No, not the introspection, the intros introspections when they lock you in a room in it. I was going to say, uh, that seems yeah. a bit harsh to, <laughs> yeah, for someone that's... who's supposedly exterior, you know, out in to, to yeah, do so... the introspection rundown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so the uh, the intro rundown then is just a, a load of, it's just an auditing thing just to address. Get you back in the body. Back in your head, I suppose. But mm. so, so I had to find the missus and say, look, you know, yeah, she was back at home with our son, who was like a few months old. I said, "Oh, this, this I explained what had happened, and that it may take a few days. And worst case, it'd be Thursday, uh, Saturday. I think I think I was on the Thursday or something like that. And um, so I sorted that out and went into auditing. And it and the first thing that we did, we addressed it, so it was done." I thought sound. Um, and what it was, the thing that actually came up was uh, when I read Hayden's story. So Hayden had left Scientology by then, told us all about what had happened and how they ended up in Birmingham and all this. Like This was this is all online. His story is quite interesting. And just reading that, I suppose it did sort of like um, rock my foundations of belief, I guess. And you know, I could see how that would have read as being out exteriorizing or, you know, I was totally like, oh, my God, you know. Um, so, yeah, we did, we addressed that and that, that was fine. And then uh, he said, right, well, well, we'll we'll finish off your security check. So I finished off the security check with loads of questions and it was all fine. And then he said, um, so it was finished. And then he came up with this other question, which I don't believe was even on the list. And he says, what do you know about OT3? I was like. Nothing apart from I've heard the name Zenu. <laughs> Big and, uh, mistake, Dave. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and bearing in mind, uh, I saw Liza when I first got to Saint Hill this time as well, and she said, "Just to let you know, no pressure, but it would be good if you started power. We could do it, you know." So they'd already got it this in mind. Um, so I went off. Uh, they invited me uh, to uh, um, what's it called? A, an R factor. They call it a reality factor. This is what what they tell you what your next Basically, thing. An R factor is basically like a reality check. That's when someone tells you this is the way it is. They give you the truth about something. That's what an yeah. R factor is. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you said you've heard about this Z new guy, and so they're like, "Well, we need to give an R factor on that. That means we need to." Yeah tell you the truth about that so that you don't believe these lies and misinformation so yeah so um i went down to they took me down this secure corridor this is where they do the ot auditing and um it's like it's locked so you it's locked from the inside it's to stop people getting in and seeing the confidential materials and reading it and dying i suppose That's, uh, yeah because it's so dangerous you know all those people who died watching south park there must have been Millions of them, but <laughs> um, so so they took me down this corridor. So there's a special code, and you can't take your phone down there. And uh, uh, there's two of them. There's Liza and this Martin Rowlands. He was the auditor. He was an arrogant bugger. And um, so he's sitting one side. She's in front of me. I said, "Right, I've got a statement from the K supervisor." He says, "Due to the nature of the materials he's been exposed to." Now, bearing in mind, all I knew is the name Zenu. I hadn't read anything else about the uh, the volcanoes and the Zenu story, and uh, and even so, to me, it, I hadn't read any of the processes. So, why would it be a problem even if I knew the story? I'm, I wasn't messing about with something that I should I wasn't ready for. 
Um, so yeah, due to the nature of the materials you've been exposed to, uh, it is imperative that you make it up to the up the bridge right away. Uh, your next step is power. You are to start this today. There is no alternative. You are to go to tech services and figure out how this can be done. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> because in Scientology's belief, if you are exposed to the OT3 materials before you're ready, you will get pneumonia and die. So if you are indoctrinated and you believe this and you might not understand the context, you don't understand what the Zeni story is, you just heard this word, they are saying, we need to get you to OT3 now to save your life because you've heard some of this information that you weren't ready for. So we need to save you and you need to get to OT3 so that you don't get pneumonia and die. That's why there's that urgency behind it. Yeah, so they gave me that statement and I was like, oh God. I, and I sort of resigned myself to the fact that I'd be starting in power. Now, I had no money to pay for it. And also it meant having the next week off work or part of the next week. That's, that, that means no money. I hadn't asked for the time off at work. I mean, I was a contractor, so it's not the end of the world. But if you're not working, yeah. you're not making any money, not right? Making it, yeah, yeah. Mm. So um, so I, I got took to, uh, to the Registrar or whatever, and uh, I said, yeah, there's, there's just no way I can pay for it anyway. And... Um, so there must be something if you got, you know, well, you know, I'd explained that I was completely screwed financially by this point. And um, the only thing I could think of was um, my wife and I, well, my partner at the time she was, um, we had a joint credit card just for paying for shopping and we paid that off every month. And... Um, Said, well, that's the only thing I think, but she ain't going to go for that. And uh, I said, well, ask her, and they start to pick, pick up the phone, find a number on the computer, phone her up. I was like, what? Pass me the phone. I was like, get out then. I'll talk to her. So I talked to her, and um, I said, look, there's, you know, I explained the situation that, that I'm really supposed to be doing this now. That's what they believe anyway. Um, but, I, you know, the only thing I'm paying, well, only thing I think is to put some on the card until I figure out how to pay for it some other way. And she says, no, just come home, Dave. You know? And yeah, yeah, I think she sort of realised I was just being <laughs> take, well, taken advantage of by this point. She says, come home. And um, so that was that. Was that. And then um, I had a text offer a while later. She said, don't put anything on that credit card. If that, if you pay for that on that credit card, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> Which you know, fair play to her. Yeah. And um, so what that meant, in technical terms, was that now I was PTS again. PTS again, exactly. And now you've got to go and resolve that issue. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I thought great. They've got it's to let me thing. go home now. Yeah. yeah, because you can't even if you suddenly come up, came up with the money. You can't do it anyway because you need to handle the PTS situation. Yeah, yeah. Very smart. Very smart, Dave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I showed them the text. And then they come back to me after a bit and said, um, yeah, the best thing to do is just to start power now because it'll all resolve. I was thinking, well, I can't, can't have auditing if I'm PTS. That's against the law. <laughs> you know, mm. that's, not, that's not how it's supposed to work. And um, and an auditing over an ARC break, like an upset with somebody, you're not supposed to do that as well. So um, I think I'd already agreed to stop that night because it was getting late anyway. And um, yeah, there was there was no way I could pay for it. But they, they, they I mean, it was ten thousand pounds. But they sort of did a bit of. You can repokery and said, "Oh yeah, well you can, you can get it for six because you had some auditing off Peter White. That's another story. Peter White was a great auditor, and then uh, he left because I think he was calling the floating needles too soon after they changed the rules on them or something, and he got declared an SP. So the fact that he got declared SP meant that all the auditing he did was invalid. So they, they managed to give me one or two 
intensives back based on that. So I had to find six and a half thousand pounds, and they're like, "Well, you know, can't one of your brothers lend you the money or your your parents?" I'm like, Fuck, no. <laughs> There's know? always a solution to yeah, every yeah. problem. Yeah. How about uh, how about your your partner's brothers? I was like, "No fucking way! Are they going to understand?" And they're like, "Well, well, if it was a, an emergency or like a life threatening illness or something, then somebody'd help you." Out. I was thinking. But this this isn't, is it? <laughs> it clearly isn't. To, to you it might be, but I wasn't. I was just losing all faith by then. Really, I thought, nah, it's bollocks. That is. Um. So, yeah, I was saying no. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Uh, so I had to stop over that night. So I stopped in a hotel. So I wasn't like sort of trapped down there, but I was mentally because I th- thought I had to, you know. I was already part of this group and I was trying to stay, remain part of the group, I guess. And, um, you know, running away wasn't, hadn't crossed my mind at that stage or <laughs> telling them to fuck off, you know, and, and going back to what you said earlier, the sunk cost fallacy, it's like you've put so much into it that why, why give up now? <laughs> um, and it just, yeah, it, it just got to a complete mess, but, um, I so I went back the next day and um, they said, "Well, you've got to do some ethics actions anyway, some, some conditions." And I was supposed to um, do these lower conditions things where I had to ask to be part of the group again. <laughs> so I had to I had to write this big long story about all the great things I've been doing, and it was pretty cool. To be fair, I'd done some cool stuff. I'd uh, give my mum some nervous issues. She had a bad back for three weeks and uh, we were due to go to a family party and I did a nervous assist and the next day it was a lot better. She said, if you could do it again, I think I'll be all right. And then that night she was dancing away. <laughs> and uh, so occasionally you'd get these little miracles that keep your faith going. Also, my uncle had been struggling with alcohol and I did a few assists and things with him. And uh, I think it sort of helped him a lot as well. So I wrote all this down about all the things I'd been doing and you know, I donated all this money to the frigging ideal org. That was another thing. Oh, yeah. Don't even get into that, <laughs> how much money we paid towards the ideal org. Um, but we should have a parking space, which we never got. So, uh... Honestly, I think you should show up and just try and park <laughs> next yeah, to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. See what happens. <laughs> yeah. It's got your name on know. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I've never been since it's opened officially. I mean, we used to use the building for events and stuff while we were still fundraising, but, mm. yeah, never seen the, uh, the new final one. thing now. Wow. Um, so, yeah, so I'm stuck down St. Hill then. I have to go around and, and ask people to sign this thing. And uh, even the captain, he was called the captain, he, he signed it, and he said, oh, yeah, that's a good write-up, you know. And, yeah. And... Um, Another thing that struck me while I was there was that they were trying to sell everybody these uh, lectures. This was after the Congress lectures, which had already released, and we had to buy these and listen to all these hell run every day in the car. I had to, as I say, waffling on about nothing for hours, and then occasionally there'd be one little gem of information. <laughs> I mean, it was funny. It was, it was funny, wasn't it? I don't know if you listened to his lectures much. Yeah, yeah that's, it. that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah, you yeah. can listen to him. For hours and but be still even if you don't take anything wiser. away from it you kind of go well you know it's yeah. not like you listen to an lrh lecture and go what a waste of time you kind of it's, yeah. it is kind of enjoyable in a weird yeah. way yeah. even if you yeah. don't take anything away from it yeah so at the time they'd released another set of lectures i can't remember what they were but i think it was like four thousand pounds again for these lectures i figured out that if i bought them and listened to one a week because I didn't have that much time to listen to them. It would take 19 years to get through them. I had that. So yeah. my return program, the first time I got kicked out, was to do, or the, well, actually, the sec- no, the second time I got kicked out, my return program originally, before it got changed, was to do the entire basics, books and lectures, pa- like courses, is extension courses from beginning to end. Now that's a course on every book and a course on every lecture. And I worked out, I can't remember if it was if I did a lesson a day I think it was if I did a lesson a day, 
I worked out it would take me three years to do the return program. And I said, this return program doesn't work for me. <laughs> There's no <Yeah>. urgency <laughs> here. So they, yeah. they gave you a new return program. But the, 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 the sheer quantity of stuff that L. Ron Hubbard came up with um, is huge. And so there's a lot to, to learn and there's a lot for them to dangle as a little carrot in front of you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, so they were trying to sell that, that, that set of lectures at the time and I thought there's no way I'm going to buy them. And uh, what struck me was that even the ethics officer, she said, oh, have you got your ACCs or whatever they were? I said, no. Nah. You really should have your own copy. I was like, hang on a minute. So the ethics officer, who knows I've got no money, <laughs> and she thinks I should own these lectures, which I could easily borrow off somebody else. Who, you know, I could easily borrow. Everybody off a is a reg in Scientology. Everybody yeah. should be a bookseller. Doesn't matter what you do, what your post is. It's your duty to get people out the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and another few things, like I went to the IS event uh, the October before, and um, all these things are starting to add up, like the fact that uh, you've, your IAS donations are supposed to be funding all these amazing outreach things and paying for these DVDs to be sent out and, and all that lot. So they created all these DVDs, and, and I knew they got these facilities to create them all super cheap. And then they're trying to sell them to us. They're saying, right, we need you to buy a set of 10 so we can send them out. But you've already made them. <laughs> it's like just pure just, just money, grab. money making. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. no, I ain't buying any. In fact, I bought one for myself. I, thought I ain't sending any out. But, yeah, so I'm still stuck down saying to you. <laughs> and um, for a couple of days. And then um, on the at the end of the second day, I'm thinking, right, I'm going home now because there's no way they can audit me with a PTS situation. And um, they said, well, what we want to do before you go back, we're going to give you some uh, auditing to address this situation with your partner. You can, um, it's like an ARC break thing, uh, like handles upsets. And you can do it, it's like doing it magically from a distance. So if you do these steps, then magically things will be better when you get back. Okay, well, yeah, I'm up for that, yeah, <laughs> make it easier. Um, so I had to go back the next morning. This was a Saturday morning, the third day. So I did that. It was okay. That, that was finished. So I'm thinking, right, I'm going to go home now. And then I said, oh, yeah. Um, another thing they kept saying to me was, um, particularly the first time I went down there, they kept saying, you don't have CS approval to leave. I was like, what? I'm not, I don't, you know, I don't work for you. I'm not owned by you. <laughs> I'm a paying pe member of the public. I don't yeah. need approval to leave. <laughs> what, what the fuck is that? You know, you don't oh, have, yeah, okay. I was like, fuck you know. But yeah, so I said that a few times as well. You don't have CS approval to leave yet. And um, I remember sitting in the, um, in the auditing room area where you wait. Uh, the bloody jive ice is on for about three days. <laughs> Classic. And like, I, I did like the Jive Aces. They were nice guys and everything. But listening to them for three days. This is a bit much, about, yeah. About being a spectator and all this shit. I was like, fucking hell. All the, all the Scientology-based songs that were singing. So I'm sitting there, like, and literally, there's people walking past with all my folders. Uh, the senior CS called loads of people into his office holding my folders right in front of me. So I know that they're all like plotting and scheming, figuring out how they're going to get me to start this next step. Even though I've told them there's, I can't afford to do it. There's no way I can do it. <laughs> um, so that, that was all going on. And um, I think it was like by sort of halfway through Saturday, I was thinking, do you know what? I'm just going to go. I'm just going to fuck off. I've had enough. I'm just going to get out of here. And um, so... Somebody came over and said, oh, can you just, have you eaten? I said, no, why? I oh, just, just go get a sandwich because we, we need to just do another step with you. I was like, what step? And they said, oh, it's just a, an attest cycle. So an attest cycle is when you 
say, yes, I finished that step or something. So I, so I thought, yeah, okay, that's just to say I've finished my security check or something and I'm all right, yeah. So I, I had my sandwich in and I went down and the, I had to go in the secure corridor again, so I had to hand my phone over. So I locked the corridor behind me and back in the auditing room and one sitting in front of me, one's at the side in front of the door and I could lock the door and it's like... I said, right, we've got a new um, uh, statement from the case supervisor. I thought, oh, good, yeah, he's going to let me go home because that's that's the only thing logically they can do. And it said, uh, due to the nature of the materials you've been exposed to, it was exactly the same thing that they said three days ago. You are to start this today. <laughs> I was like, oh, God. No, this thinking, again. Just, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, fucking out. And I felt trapped then. I was actually scared for my life. And I was like, I was just like, yeah, it's the, it's the only time I've ever felt really trapped in my life. I was like, how am I going to get out of this? So I took a deep breath and I said, oh, so they were saying, well, we've got some hours on you from, from Birmingham. We can use a bit of auditing. So we can start you tonight. You go home, sort things out with your missus, come back with the money tomorrow. <laughs> And then you can carry on. I was like, what fucking planet are you on? I, was, I wasn't saying this because I didn't want to, you know. And also, I think I think what people need to understand about Scientology is that you've already signed something at the start of each course to say that if you go insane, you don't want psychiatrists to look after you. You're going to do the introspection rundown. Now, the introspection rundown is they'll lock you up in a room and uh, not talk to you, and they'll just feed you until you snap out of your psychosis. And apparently this worked for one person on the ship once, and that became the, the, the basis of it. And there's obviously the story of Lisa McPherson, the tragic story about her. So, um, I mean, you can look into that. But um, So there was no way that I, in that position, I couldn't just say, right, fuck off, I'm going home, you can't stop me. I'm going to, you know, I could have easily fought my way out of there. I'm a big lad, you know. I could have caused a big scene. But to me, to me at the time, it was like, I thought if I did that, I'd get overpowered eventually with a lot of people and I'd be thrown into a room and I'd be trapped there. So I couldn't sort of take that approach. So I said, I said, okay. Um, I don't want to get audited tonight. I said, I want to go home, handle the PTS situation with my partner, and um, I'll come back tomorrow with the money. And um, they said, oh, they were talking to each other. Oh, I don't want to get commived over this. That means brought in front of a, a big jury, <laughs> an internal jury. <laughs> they were more scared of getting into trouble than... than than upsetting the senior CS or whatever, than upsetting me, I suppose. So, yeah, I didn't matter. They had to follow, they had to complete their orders. So I said, okay, we'll clear this with the CS. We'll take it back. So luckily, they opened the door. We walked up the corridor, and I was outside, and um, I was out in the reception. I said, okay, we'll, we'll uh, wait here then. Uh, we'll go and see what the CS has to say. So um, so I said to reception, I said, can I, can I just have my phone? I just want to make a quick call. Because <laughs> my phone's, you know, I couldn't even phone anybody while I was stuck in that room. So they gave me my phone back and I casually walked outside into the courtyard and then I just walked around the corner. As soon as I could see the car park, I was like, right, <laughs> get out of here. And uh, I just switched my phone off, got in the car and I floored it all the way up to Oxford Services. I um, I left my phone off because I didn't want any harassment. And uh, and in fact, whilst I was there, uh, somebody had ran off from the um, from the Saint Hill auditing area. She'd gone back home, but she lived local. Half an hour later, they'd been and fetched her. So I was thinking, oh, they're just going to follow me. They're going to try and get me back. It was quite scary. So um, I yeah, I drove up to Oxford Services and I, I found the missus and said. Said, I'm totally done. I said, I'm, I'm coming home, but I'm totally finished. Just, you know, just wait there for me, you know. 
And um, I, mean, I just left her a message because she wasn't in. Um, I said, I'm keeping my phone off. I'll be back at whatever time. So, um, and uh, yeah, we, we sort of, she was pleased that I was sort of come to my senses, I guess. And um, I was, I was escaped. Well, firstly, congratulations. And I think <laughs> what a whirlwind story. I think that's one thing a lot of people need to realize. And that's why I like speaking to as many people as possible is that, you know, we hear a lot about the Sea Org experience, the staff experience in LA and Clearwater. You were a paying member of the public. You were just a normal parishioner, Scientologist. You didn't work for the church. And yet you were still in a situation where you were locked in a room. You couldn't leave. And the only way to leave was to physically escape, to run around yeah. the corner, up the road, get in your car and floor it all the way up to Oxford Services. You can't like... This is what people need to understand is this abuse, harassment and manipulation and control happens not just in America in the high up orgs. It happens at every level of every church of Scientology in every city in the world to everybody, to every parishioner. And that's why I think it's so important to tell as many people's stories as possible. And, you know, thank you for, for sharing yours. How did we get to where we are now? with you being ready to speak out um because it's a big step to share your story publicly yeah i mean I've, I've thought about it for for a while i mean i did start writing a book and i thought i'd just finish that book before i speak out <laughs> because uh, you know if i get harassed or something then it might just put a stop to that and the reason i started writing the book was partly to sort of help me come to terms with with what had happened um and so over the years there's been a lot of sort of um educating myself i guess um i think everybody sort of goes through the same sort of stages of recovery they at first they probably still believe in hubbard and his tech and um i mean i i almost ended up involved in something else called spiritology there's a lot of people jump from cult to cult <laughs> But um, yeah, because because I still still sort of believed Hubbard's tech, I thought, oh well, the only option then is the free zone or the independents or whatever. So there's all these people doing the same stuff outside for like a lot less money, and um, so the spiritology thing was um, a guy in in Germany who claimed he was LRH. Re reborn another one there's been many of those <laughs> <There's loads in laughs> there. I, I, I like the current one though it's, it's you know lrh should definitely come back as a criminal wouldn't he yeah, yeah. so yeah well he was a criminal in his last life why would he be a criminal on this one but that's it yeah it does fit but uh yeah so is I'd it youtube this... and watching the videos of everyone's messages that kind of helped you get to that place where oh you're god yeah 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 turn? i spe especially like with you concentrating more on the uk I mean, I, I sort of thought that there never seemed to be much interest in people in the UK because there's this assumption that it doesn't really go on over here. And, um, yeah, so um, once I saw your stuff coming up and then I saw Chris Mailing speaking, I thought, yeah, I'm sort of ready to speak, I guess. <laughs> Maybe we need to get you to start your own channel, Dave. That's the next oh, step. Oh, <laughs> God, yeah, yeah. I think you, you might need to put subtitles on this one, though, so because uh, of my accent, but... <laughs> it will be um, interesting to see how uh, easy it is for the American audience to understand the Birmingham accent. Yeah. Because obviously, I have no issue with it because I, you know, understand. I'm British. I get it, all the accents in the UK, but uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But my we'll my accent is actually black country, so um, right. even people in Birmingham have trouble understanding me. <laughs> we're just a bit, we're just like fifteen miles north or something. It's and a whole different world. It's yeah. a whole different. Yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah. Well, so, uh, yeah, when have you, have you got a date for the book? Do you know what's happening with that? Are you still writing it? Have you kind of parked the idea? I sort of now? have fits and starts. So the start of this year, I thought, right, I'm going to finish it now, and uh, I did a bit for a few months, and then I've sort of stopped again. But it is quite it's quite difficult trying to confront all the things that happened, and it's quite draining to go through all that stuff. I think, and and trying to put things right in the right time timeline as well so um but it's quite therapeutic isn't it to go through yeah. it and, and get it written down and 
Yeah, um, I mean, I, I might finish it one day. I mean, it might be a few years, I think, realistically. But, um, oh. but yeah, I still, um, for, for me, sort of recovery-wise, there's, there's, there's a lot of things I've had to learn over the years. And uh, probably one of the best books on addressing Hubbard was Piece of Blue Sky, which was John Atak's book. And um, that was the first time. I mean, I'd read the other one, The Barefaced Messiah. I thought, right, let's just, you know, I've got to sort of face the idea that maybe it was all bullshit, not just because <laughs> I'd read Blown for Good by Mark Headley when I first left. And I read some more of the top management and all the bad stuff they've been going through, you know, which was quite an eye-opener because as, as a parishioner, you think everybody at the top level is super, you know, capable and everything's great and they're all ethical and none of that. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I did have to face up to the idea that it was all nonsense and L LRH was a con man. And um, so, yeah, I read a few books about that and um, then I was became interested. I was like, you know, to, to an outsider, I must look completely gullible and keep paying all this money out. And I, I wanted to know why. Why what was it? Was I manipulated? Was I just stupid? And um so I, I come across the book um Combating Cult Mind Control by Steve Hassan, brilliant book. And um it sort of explained all the common commonalities across cults and how they manipulate people. And um because I never thought I was brainwashed, I just thought I knew better than most people having the tech and all this like you that it's it's a very humbling thing leaving Scientology because you do get quite arrogant. I think there was times when I was arrogant in my job, uh, when I was really getting in, when I was really into Scientology towards the end, and uh, that cost me, you know, probably cost me some jobs. Yeah, so I mean, it's a, that's it's a mindset that comes along with it because you've got the tech, you've got this amazing stuff that you can use. You're doing a really important mission. You know, you're helping yourself and helping the planet, and you don't even understand, like you lowly other person, because you don't have any clue about Scientology. I'm better than you because I understand that I'm doing something that's going to make a real difference here. That's yeah. the mindset that a Scientologist is in, and it's uh, it does take a lot to kind of get out of that mindset and learn, you know, I'm just a normal person, you know, there's nothing special about me. There's nothing special about Scientology. You know, the, you know, it's just all part of that manipulation tactic. It is. Yeah. You're just like from, from one, one minute, you're sort of saving the world and you're special. You're one of the pioneers. And then the next, you're just like, same as everybody else. You're nothing special. <laughs> and it's quite a bit of a, you're like, Oh God. Yeah. Well, Why one you... minute you're one of the pioneers saving the world, and the next minute you're literally having to run for your life to escape from the group, right? That's yeah, yeah. That's what happens. Yeah, and you've got to build your life up again as well. It's it's not just uh, the fact that you know when there's a when there's a bridge in front of you, you know where you're going. It's like yeah, I'm going to be doing all these steps, and I'm going to be amazing or whatever, and. Um, for me, the, the biggest thing was the financial issue, was getting straight financially. Um, I was sort of on the verge of financial ruin when I left. Um, there, was, there was another story as to why, part, partly to do with why that was, that in that towards the end, when, when I first met my other partner, I didn't want to burden her with a lot of my debts. So I looked into, there was a lot of adverts about you can, write off 80% of your debt legally and it's government approved or, or all this. Like. And a lot of staff at the time were doing these IVAs, individual voluntary agreements or something like that. So they'd get into loads of debt and they'd just do one of these. And, uh, you know, because I weren't earning much money, it didn't matter. And I looked into that at first and it was like, well, I could actually save more myself and not ruin my credit rating by um, just refinancing. So I did that. But later on, um, I thought, right, I'm going to see if I can write off some of this legally. And um, I was talking to a chap, uh, Todd. He was one of the core supervisors. He'd actually got a job working for one of these companies. And they said, yeah, yeah they can help you write off your debt. <laughs> and you see where this is going. So, uh, you know, trusting somebody who's a Scientologist because they're the most ethical beings on the planet and they wouldn't get involved in anything 
dodgy. Um, I uh, went along with it. I said, yeah, yeah, sort me out then, because I want to sort of write this off. And it was this, uh, I think it's called Credit Card Killer. And uh, what, the, what they did was um, they would take over your debts. They'd uh, take them on. You, you, they'd buy them off you. And um, they would just argue the way out of it in court using contract law or something. So you had to pay a percentage. So I paid a bit of money for this stuff. And uh, then afterwards, he told me, he said, oh, they'll still come, because you have to write to the banks and say what you've done. You say you've sold it to this person. And uh, then I got some letters saying, yeah, you can't do that. So I said, why, why have I had a letter? And he said, well, yeah, he told me afterwards that, yeah, they'll still come after you. It's just uh, you have to just keep a log of all the times to try and call you and stuff. And, uh, and then when it, when it gets to the court, I'll go to court and they'll get it written off for you. So basically, fraud. My, yeah, basically, <laughs> yeah. So, so I sort of went along with it. So I, I was filling in these logs every time they called. Apparently, they could find them thirty pounds. So I bought this uh, machine that had just because I was getting like thirty, forty calls a day from all these credit card companies and everything. So you were scammed. You, you were scammed, but you you were a victim of a fraud scam. Yeah. From a Scientologist, as part yeah, of your. Yeah. That's... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if he knew, you know, he, I, don't, I don't know if he knew it was a scam as well. He was working for this guy. And um, so a couple of years later, so I was just filling these forms in and stuff. You had to keep these logs. And then I get uh, a court summons for one of the, the loans. And uh, so I email this place and say, you know, can you sort this out then? And I now reply, I have a look, bit of a Google. Find him uh, on on a newspaper. The bloke who ran, ran it, jailed for four years. <laughs> I was like, "Fuck you know." <laughs> so, um, so what I had to do was, um, I went to see a, a proper um, a proper lawyer who dealt with uh, insolvency and all that stuff. I said, I told him what happened. He said, "Yeah, yeah, it happens." Mate. <laughs> you're, st you're still liable to everything. Plus, you know, you'd already paid these people, so you've been scammed by them. And um, so basically that completely ruined my credit history. Even though my credit was, I had tremendous amount of credit owed before um, and I was unlikely to get any more, at least I was still paying it. So I got to the point where I hadn't been paying these things. I had people turning up at the door saying, you know, debt collectors and stuff. And then they'd pass it on to other, other debt collectors. And this went on for a few years. And, um, yeah, it completely ruined my uh, financial uh, credit score, whatever. And that took seven years. It took seven years to sort out because basically I was ruined then. So, um, I mean, I was still earning money. So I had to, it took seven years before I could get a mortgage again. Uh, yeah, so um, that sort of, and that, that, again, I mean, I know that wasn't particularly Scientology as such, but that was, there was I think there's a few of them were working for this company. And that, that's having that trust, believing that they're the, you know, they're not going to do anything unethical. This is what Scientologists do. You know, you, you're trying to help each other. And you think you're the most ethical people on the planet and you're trying to find any which way you can to find a little loophole or a little gray area or a, um, a gap in the system that allows you to carry on doing Scientology in whatever way you can. This is just the way they operate around the world you know yeah yeah but um, dave look we yeah. should start wrapping things up i think yeah, yeah. this has been fascinating and yeah. i can't wait to do another one with you yeah you're up for it <laughs> yeah where we can yeah, delve yeah. into all the stories about the people that we both know because we've spoken before um, yeah, yeah. recorded and we've got some names and people that we both know and some stories i want to get into from your time yeah, at definitely. st hill um and some stories from Birmingham as well. So let's yeah. do that if you're up for it. And we can we can tell some more of those personal stories because I feel like we've only just touched the tip of the iceberg. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. There's so much more I could say. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dave, thank you so much for your time. And yeah. let's do this again soon. And yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I think, yeah, 
the more people that share this story, you never know who's going to hear this and might remember you or remember a time or was involved in something and this can help them. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's very brave of you to speak out and I'm sure it's going to do nothing but help people. So thank you for your time. Thank you.